How are we doing out there? Hey, um, so Packer fans. Hey, I just want you to know I'm so sorry for your loss. My heart just breaks for you guys. Oh, what a tragedy. You were right in that game all the way up until the end. <laughs> Come on now, I know it's petty of me. I get that. I know it's petty, but it's all we Chicago sports fans have is to hate watch the Packers and then make fun when they lose. Anyway, shifting gears. Question, how many of you guys would say, I am a fisherman, fisherwoman, I like to fish? Woo! All right, somebody's really excited about fishing up top. I am not. I am not a fisherman. I'm a little bit of a catcherman. I like the action of it all, but I don't get the idea of fishing. I mean, if I want a fish, I know I can just go to the store and buy one. Like, if I want a hamburger, I don't go out into a field and kill a cow to get a hamburger. So I just, the concept, it's a little weird to me, and people, they get a little too much into it. Spend all this money, they buy all this gear, and it always cracks me up when you see people fishing, by the way. They're, like, standing on their boat wearing camo, and I'm like, you know they can't see you, right? <laughs> like you're wearing the camo. If the big boat didn't give it away, I don't know. But it's just funny to me. But then they spend all this time out there, and they don't catch anything. And I'm like, how are things with six-second memories outsmarting humans? And they're like, well, we just didn't have the right lures. I'm like, you spent $400 on that lure. It sparkles like Lady Gaga. What more does that lure need to do? And they're like, well, Greg, you just don't appreciate the sport of fishing. OK, OK. Can we just agree together, church family, that anything that you do where you can drink beer and sit at the same time probably does not qualify as a sport. Let's just agree <laughs> that it's not a sport. Now, I will say I've been deep sea fishing, and I would say that's a sport because that is some catching, not just fishing, and there's some action to that, and it's a lot of fun. It gets a little intense. It gets a little competitive. You wake up at like 3 a.m. You got charts and a playbook, and you're trying to figure out what, where you're going to go. It's like you got your fish finder. I'm like, yeah, they're in the ocean. <laughs> it's like they're in the water. But you know, you're trying to figure it all out. And then if you're really getting into it, and you want to have a really good experience, you got to hire a boat captain. And these guys are the salt of the earth, man. If you've never hired a boat captain to go, this like old man in the sea, these are your true patch and peg leg type guys. All right, they're rough, they're intense, they're really into it. So anyways, all that to say, I went fishing with a friend or a group of us, we were fishing. And this captain, he's like laying it all out, all the things we got to do. And my friend, he hooks a dolphin fish. Some of you now, you're like, <gasps> dolphin fish. It's different. It wasn't a dolphin. So chill out, everybody. Okay. We weren't hooking dolphins out there in the Gulf of Mexico. So he hooks a dolphin fish. And now all of a sudden this thing's just pulling him around the boat. So he's running around the boat to which the captain is yelling at him. Don't pull against the line. Don't pull against the line. Stop pulling against the line. And as he's running around, he's like, aren't I supposed to pull against the line? Like, how am I supposed to get the thing in the boat? Well, the line snapped. And not only did the line snap, but this captain snapped. And he started cussing out my friend. And he's just standing there with the rod and a broken line. Like, what just happened? And we're looking at each other. And I'm like, I think we just paid a lot of money to get cussed out. That's what just happened. <laughs> like, this was intense. And so he walks away. And he comes back a few minutes later. And he's like, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm just passionate about fishing. I'm like, yeah, we caught that. <laughs> we see that you're passionate. And there's something called Xanax that can help you with that type of... <laughs> passion. But one thing that's just true about fishermen, they are a passionate group. And here's your pastoral segue, professional transition, what's about to happen right now. There was a guy in the Bible who was passionate about fishing. And then one day he encounters Jesus. And when he meets Jesus, he realizes that they both share a similar passion for fishing, yet with a twist. And so today we're going to be in primarily two different chapters of the Bible. We're going to be in Luke chapter 5, and then in a little bit, we're going to jump to Acts chapter 4. So if you'd like to open up your Bible app, you can do so to Luke chapter 5. If you're like, I don't want to open up my Bible app, that's fine. We'll put it up on the sky screen for you, for your reading and enjoyment. Luke 5, starting with verse 1. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, this is also Simon Peter, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Let me pause really quick. This is early in Jesus' ministry. He has yet to call his disciples to follow him. Large crowds are now gathering to hear Jesus speak. He speaks unlike anyone 
that they've ever heard before. And as this large crowd is now pressing in, Jesus realizes, I need a PA system so that everybody can hear me. So he asked to borrow this boat for the boat to be pushed over out onto the water so that his voice can carry over the water. He's God. He knows how science works. It's amazing. Verse four, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Now, I love, if you've never seen, and you heard me talk about this a little this last week, I love The Chosen. I think it's really good. It, it, it personifies some of these stories and helps bring them to life. Well, I love the way The Chosen captures what happens next. So take a look. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right, that's your word. It's such a great scene. Jesus is just laughing. So Peter, he'd been out fishing all night. He's tired. All of a sudden, he gets this free sermon. He listens to the sermon. The guy says, cast the gnat on the other side of the boat. They have that awkward stare off. And then he does it. It's like, hmm, oh, hmm. And then all these fish come. It's like, Peter, maybe you should have had some camo on so the fish couldn't have seen you. Uh, it's your fault that you didn't catch anything that night. That's what I thought, but whatever. It's just a great exchange. So let's now dive back into the narrative, verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Now we talked about this a little bit last week, how Jesus flips the idea of religion on its head. Because in this culture at this time, you have to understand that you had to be clean to approach God. You had to be clean to be in the presence of a holy man. And so he recognizes himself as unclean and thus why he's afraid. He's thinking he's about to eat a lightning bolt. Oh no, something, this, I'm in front of a holy man. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. I'm dead. But what religion does, and so once again, what we talked about last week, is it makes us think that when we're at our worst, when we recognize something sinful about ourselves or something we don't like, that God wants to run away from us. But what Jesus shows us is that even on our worst day, that God runs to you. And so God knew we could never be clean on our own. This is why he sent Jesus. And Jesus came with a personal mission statement. We see in Luke chapter 19, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Well, this is Peter. He's lost. This is you. This is me. He comes to seek and save the lost. And why? Because Jesus is passionate about fishing for people. He is passionate about the one. He is passionate about going after those who are far from God. And then when the lost are found, he does something. He gives his mission to them, and he hopes that we now share his passion for fishing. So look at verse 10. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So he's all amped up. He's all excited. It says right there in that moment, he decides to go all in. He's going to follow Jesus. He probably glosses over what this idea of fishing for people even looks like. Because what's that job description look like? He knows what it's like to be a fisherman. Now we, 2,000 years later, we have a little bit more context. We understand to some degree exactly what Jesus meant when he called him to be a fisher of people. But if you think about Peter in that moment, he did not follow Jesus to get a new job. He didn't follow Jesus to get a job description. He leaves everything to follow Jesus because of the miracle that he had just witnessed and the fact that this long-awaited Messiah, the Christ, something that they have been praying for for generations, he is now right in front of them and he has called him into a relationship. 
And so he's like, yeah, I'm willing to leave everything because of what I saw and who you are. But now put yourself in Peter's shoes. Put yourself on the shore for a second. If you were honest about this moment, you wouldn't say, hey, Jesus, now, if I'm going to leave everything to follow you, tell me about my job. Tell me about my job description. And he's like, oh, you're going to fish for people. Okay, that's cool. What are the bennies? Like, what's the pay look like? Okay, treasures in heaven. See how that aligns with the 403B? Like, right? You wouldn't ask that. You'd say, okay, Jesus, if I'm going to leave everything to follow you, then tell me, Jesus, that I'm going to be a better person. Tell me, Jesus, I'm going to be more holy. Tell me I'm going to be more disciplined. Tell me I'm going to have a better life. Tell me I'm going to be happy. Tell me I'm going to be whole. Tell me, Jesus, what is in this for me? Because that's what we sign up for, right, when we follow Jesus. Because no one in the room today, it's all right, we're in church. We can be honest in church, me included. No one in the room today signed up to follow Jesus to be a fisher of people. We signed up to follow Jesus because we knew we needed Jesus. It's like, I needed Jesus. Jesus, that's why I follow Jesus. I hear this message of grace and forgiveness that I'm not on the hook for my sins. I hear about how I can be set free, that that sin no longer has bondage over me, but that I can be, instead of a slave to sin, I can be a slave to Christ, that I've been set free. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. I was hurt, lonely, insecure, and his love comes in and it makes me whole. And then on top of that, this whole idea of heaven over hell, this is a pretty good deal. This is pretty awesome to know that our eternal destination is now secure, that death no longer ends our story, but death is just the beginning of our story, that it begins a whole new chapter. That's what I wanted when I followed Jesus. And the good news is all of that is true plus some. We get all of that when we follow Jesus because John 10.10 says that he came to give us life and life to the fullness. But I think sometimes we stop right there. Like, ooh, I like this life, abundant life business, and man, heaven over hell, and I got grace, and we'll just hit the pause button. But that's only part of the story. That's the part of the story that's centered on ourselves. And yes, we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the more you experience God, the more you experience Jesus, you will love him more when you know you've been forgiven much. You will love much, but there's a second part to following. Yes, we are to love the Lord our God, and we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We are called to love others. Okay, now this gets a little hard, because I can do this whole love God thing. I can figure that out, but now you're calling something extra out of me, to love others, because other fish, they can be slimy sometimes. Other fish, they can be a little scaly. Other fish, they got sharp teeth. They can be critical or judgmental. But when you chase this story all the way back to the shore, Jesus wants his followers to know right from the beginning that you may choose to follow me for personal reasons, and that's okay. But to do faith right, you will live for others because faith is not about you. And so the very last instruction that we see Jesus give his disciples, his followers, is at the end of the Gospels, and he tells them to go, go into the world. Take this good news that you've experienced now and share it with everyone. Go and make disciples. So the very first thing that Peter hears from him, from Jesus, and the very last thing that Peter hears from Jesus is a command to go fish. And what we see in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, And these four accounts in between these two commands is Peter, he spends three years walking with Jesus, three years traveling with Jesus, three years learning from Jesus. And as he's growing and learning and understanding, we see eventually he begins to understand what that means because he sees Jesus live for others. He, he sees Jesus be outward focused. He, he sees Jesus live for those in the margins. He sees that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. There's one moment in particular, it's in three of the four gospel accounts, Matthew 17, that's your homework. If you want some homework, you're like, no, I don't. But if you do, you can go read Matthew 17 later because we're not going to dive into it. And Peter, you see in this narrative, he's getting a sense of what Jesus is actually calling them into. It's a pretty cool story in the Bible. You see three guys, you see Peter, James, and John. This is kind of the inner sanctum, the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. And they go up on a mountainside with Jesus. And when they go up on this mountainside with Jesus, something holy happens. 
A miracle happens right before their eyes. Jesus is transfigured right before them. The Bible says his face shines like the sun. His clothes become bright like light, and they now see Jesus as deity. He reveals himself in his glory as God. So now all of a sudden, right, you, you have this carpenter, you have this Jewish boy that's been hanging out with you, and then all of a sudden, light is shining out of him. All of a sudden, deity right before your face. All of a sudden, the glory of God has been made manifest. To top it off, now all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show up. Well, to, to two Jewish boys, this is like the Hebrew all-star team. Big Mo, Moses is here, Elijah, that's amazing. And then the little cherry on top of this holy Sunday that's happening right before their eyes is God speaks. And when God speaks is, this is my son, now you should listen to him. Okay, you think they should listen to him? And so Peter, the Bible is funny, he doesn't know what to do. None of us would know what to do, right? He's in shock, he's in awe. And so he's like, we should set up camp here. We should get some tents and hang out. And who wouldn't want to set up camp there? Once again, you got the all-star team, God speaking. You get to see Jesus in all of his glory. This is a holy moment. Oh, but they couldn't stay. The Bible says they had to go back down the mountain. And why? Because there was work to do in the valleys. Because that's where the people were at. You see, if Jesus wanted to stay in his glorified state, he could have stayed up in heaven. But he came down to get into the mess, to go into the valleys, to get into our story so that we would learn and understand who he is. And now you see that Peter's really starting to get it. I am supposed to have personal mountaintop moments with Jesus. The more I experience Jesus, the more I spend time with Jesus, the more I know Jesus, I will love him more and understand more of who he is. But I am also to do his work in the valleys. I am to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. I am to go where his people are at. Why? They need to know what I know. They need to experience what I've experienced. They need to see what I've seen. So we are to love God and we are to love others. And they always go hand in hand. I am the mission and he died for me, but I am on mission. I'm gonna live for others. I am the mission. He came to know me and to have a personal relationship with me, but I am on mission. He leaves the 99 for the one. He is a God who cares about the lost. And so by the time we hit the book of Acts, which tells you about the start of the church, Peter, he's all in. He's all in as a fisher of people. He's all in owning Jesus' mission. He understands the job description. He's got the bullet points laid out. He's like, I know what I, what I need to do and I'm gonna do it. So now you may be wondering, okay, that's great, Greg. Great for Peter, too. Way to go, Peter. A-plus effort, man. Proud of you. The rock that built the church. All right. Okay, cool. But I'm not Peter. So what am I supposed to do with this? Or how am I supposed to do that? And what we see now in Acts chapter 3 and in Acts chapter 4 is Peter actually shows us how we can fish. He gives us a roadmap for how we can do the very thing that God has called us into. But not only how we can fish, he tells us why it matters. Now, some context on the book of Acts. You have to understand, Jesus, we know, on Good Friday, was crucified. He died three days later, resurrected. Then, about 40 days after that, ascended. woo -hoo -hoo, Floats into heaven. Pretty cool. Ten days after that, Pentecost. Holy Spirit comes to the early church. When the Holy Spirit comes, it says the believers are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. What do they do? They go out and they start preaching and talking about Jesus. As they start preaching and talking about Jesus, the Bible in the book of Acts says thousands are saved every single day. And so now we're in Acts chapter three, Peter and John, they're on their way to the temple. They're going to the temple to pray. And on the way to the temple, they meet a, a beggar who's at the beautiful gate. And this is a, a well-known gate. And this is a well-known beggar. And he's sitting there and he asks, so the Bible says he's a lame man that asks for some money, so, for some silver, for some gold, to which Peter says to him, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I freely give. In the name of Jesus, walk. And my man pops up and starts screaming and praising God and running around. And as you could imagine, this creates quite the scene. It, it, it literally kind of gives you the picture that they cling to their arms as they walk into the temple and a crowd gathers because people recognize the beggar who was sitting at the gate. And they're like, wasn't that the guy? Don't we walk by him all the time? We've seen him dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times. He couldn't walk. 
He's walking now. What happened? Like, how did this happen? And so Peter recognizes this moment, wisely uses this opportunity to talk about Jesus. He sees the open door and he just walks through it. And that's something all of us should do is look for opportunities, open doors that open up in front of us to talk about Jesus. And when that open door comes, we just walk through it and you say, how? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. But this is quite the ruckus. And so the religious leaders at this time, they come out, they're investigating, hmm, what's happening here? Hmm, right? So they're coming to check out all of this. They hear Peter talking about Jesus. They go, well, wait one second. We killed Jesus. That should have ended all of this Jesus talk. And so they are immediately arrested and brought before the high council. And the high council, you say, well, who's the high council? These were the religious leaders of the leaders. These were the guys that were in charge. And they start grilling Peter. Now we're in Acts chapter four, verse seven. This is the question they ask. By what power or in whose name have you done this? Notice they can't deny that a healing occurred. My man is running around screaming, praising God. So this ain't like, is he faking it? This is like, whoa, 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 something happened, how? Now, once again, context matters. Understanding what's happening to a certain degree when you read these stories matters. These are the same guys, the big wigs, the head honchos that put Jesus to death. Peter, a month and a half earlier, in a pressure situation, the worst day in human history, what did Peter do when he was confronted as being a follower of Jesus? The Bible tells us he denied Jesus three times. Under the pressure, Peter folded. Peter walked away. Peter hid. And now all of a sudden, the same guys that crucified Jesus are now grilling Peter. This is a big moment for Peter. Would he fold? Would he run and hide? Would he walk away? Well, look at verse 10. Let me clearly say to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Oh, dang, Peter. Okay, Peter. I see you, Peter. You're bringing the heat today. You got some Holy Ghost fire in you today, Peter. You're not playing around. He ain't scared. He's like, oh, you want to know how he can walk? The guy you killed, Jesus, boom, rose from the dead. He's alive, suckers, and he be healing people up in here. <laughs> he just lays it out for them. Like he's, not, he's bringing the heat to which these guys are taken aback. So I love what it says in verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. So these religious leaders, they're blown away. They're like, weren't these guys fishermen? And here they are, they're schooling us. They had no religious training, but yet they're taking us to task right now. They're bold, they're passionate, they're clear. And when they looked at these guys, they're like, wait a minute, something's different about these guys. Like something's happening right now with this crew. And yeah, they were different because they had been with Jesus. And when you had been with Jesus, that tends to change you. When you encounter the living Christ, that begins to transform you from the inside out. And when you have been with Jesus, it qualifies you to stand before any audience and share your testimony, to share your story. And so what's funny is it, you read the narrative, the guys are kind of like, all right, just wait here. And they confer, they pull off to the side. They're like, I don't know what to do. This guy, the beggar's bouncing around. Right? Like we can't, we can't arrest them. Everybody's like praising God for what happened. What are we going to do? And so this is their plan. Sometimes it's just funny. This is plan. We'll just tell them to stop it. <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get together. Let's come on. Okay. Hey guys, stop it, please. Stop talking about Jesus. You're warned. This is your warning. I'm a good guy. I'm going to let you off the hook. It's like a cop. He pulls you over, gives you a warning. He's like, hey, don't speed again. You're like, "Uh uh-huh. Okay, I got (laughs) you. Right? Wink, wink. This is like trying to tell a kid on Christmas, hey, can you sleep in? Ain't going to happen. Right? This is a terrible plan. To which Peter says in verse 19, Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. We can't stop, won't stop. We're going to follow God. 
We're going to obey God. We can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard. And right here in this simple passage, Peter, he shows us how we are to fish. Now, it's simple. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's always easy. And the first thing we have to know is that God is asking you to live on mission. God is asking you, not me, not the church, not your small group. He has called you to go into the world. He has given the great commission to you. You believe that God has asked you to live on mission. And then if you believe that, you obey God, which means that sometimes you will have to care way more about what God thinks than what someone else thinks. That's what that means. When a door opens, you can't be afraid to walk through it to know that God maybe has opened that door. He has put you on mission. He has put you in that moment or in that opportunity for a reason. You are not on the hook for the outcome. That's not what he's told you to. You're not on the hook for how someone receives a response to what you have to say. You are on the hook to obey, to believe that you have been called to live on mission and then do what he's asked you to do. Now, there's a lot of people out there, Christians included, that believe this whole idea of fishing for people evangelizing or telling others about Jesus. Well, that's weird and it could be offensive. You know what? Just let people believe whatever they want to believe and God will sort it out in the end. And if you are a Christ follower, I want you to know that's a cop out. And we say that often because I think we're just scared to obey. But notice that Jesus told us to go. And if he told us to go, he didn't give us an out. He didn't give you a caveat. He said, go into the world, which means we have to do what he's called us to do. He didn't give us an option to not obey. And why did Jesus care if we go? Why does he want us to talk about it? And it's because Jesus is not intuitive. You say, Greg, I don't know what that means. Jesus is not a philosophy. Jesus is not an idea. Jesus is not a religion. He was a living person who went to a cross died for our sins, three days later was resurrected, and then ascended into heaven. Holy Spirit comes, fills us up to do what? To tell the story of a living person. You can't sit underneath a tree and think spiritual things and land on the idea of Jesus. Because once again, it's not an idea. He was real and he's alive. It's a story that he told us to share. It's a story that's meant to be told because people will only hear about Jesus if someone tells them about Jesus. You are here right now because someone told you at some point, now you may not be able to perfectly recall when that point was, but somebody told you about Jesus. And if you're afraid to tell them, then you won't share it with them. And if you won't share it with them, then they won't know. And if not you then who? If not you, then who? Now, I'm not telling us, okay, today after church, guys, we're going to do a little field trip to Home Depot. We're all going to buy some wood and build our own personal soap boxes and then map out the corners on the city of Rockford where we're going to stand and tell the city about Jesus. It's not what I'm saying. And, and I surely am not telling you to be weird. And next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about how not to be weird because some of y'all are weird. Let me just throw that out there. <laughs> Right? And there's weird ways to talk about Jesus and there's genuine ways. So we'll come back next week, we'll talk about that. But when you look at Peter, Peter, he is showing us how to talk about Jesus. He's actually telling us how not to be weird. He says, we can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard. We've experienced Jesus. I've seen Jesus. I've seen his miracles. I've heard his teaching. I've seen love in action. I've heard the way he expresses grace and truth. I saw him die. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw him die. And then three days later, I saw him alive. I saw it. I experienced it. How can I not share that with others? You know, another reason I think sometimes we're so hesitant to talk about Jesus is we think, well, well, I'm not qualified. I don't have all the answers. And they're going to have questions. And if they have questions and I don't have the answers, I'm going to look like an idiot. And if I don't have the answers, I'm not qualified to talk about it. So I shouldn't talk about it. Right? So because I, I don't know what to do if the pressure is turned on, the heat's turned on, I won't know what to say. And that's not to say that we shouldn't try to learn or understand more 
about what we believe. And that's why Alpha might be a really great opportunity for you to do two things. One, for you to grow on in some of the fundamentals of your faith. Two, you want to talk about low-hanging fruit for you to invite somebody to church. Alpha would be a really good thing for you to reach out to someone and invite them to Alpha because it unpacks a lot of what we believe. But when you look back at the disciples, they simply told their story of what they had seen and heard. Hey guys, I may not be able to explain to you the mechanism behind resurrection, but I saw it. I may not be able to understand all of the theology from the Messiah to the New Testament, but I met them. They just told their story of what they had experienced. And you know what? All of us know how to tell our story of what we've experienced. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to be trained to talk about what you've experienced. We all, from a very young age, love to tell stories of what we've experienced. You see a movie. It's a great movie. You're, oh, I got to talk about this movie. Spider-Man, y'all, there were three Spider-Mans. Can you believe there were three? I just ruined it for you. Spoiler alert, there's three Spider-Mans. But you're like, there's three Spider-Mans. It was amazing. You talk about the movie. TV show, such a great TV show. You got to stream it. It's on Apple TV or wherever it's at. Or something your kids do right? Your kids are like, oh my, you should see my son play soccer. Oh, little Timmy's a gazelle out there. Oh, he runs so fast. He kicks the ball like lightning. And by the way, nobody cares about your kid. Not one person, (laughs) not one person cares about Timmy on the soccer field, but you don't care because you saw him. You experienced it. You're proud. You're going to share the story of what Timmy did. Or you go to a concert. Oh, Taylor Swift. Woo, Tay Tay. And you get all excited. You can tell people about the concert that you, you meet somebody famous. You're like, oh, they were so nice. They were so nice in real life. I couldn't believe how nice they were. We took a selfie. It was so amazing. You go to a sporting event. Something crazy happens at a sporting event. What do you do? Oh, I was there. And, and I've told this story in nauseam. I mean, some of y'all are going to roll your eyes as soon as I said it. I was at game seven of the World Series when the Cubs won it all in 2016. And some of you are like, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And some of you are like, well, we don't care. Well, I care because I saw it. I saw Bill Murray. I touched him, right? I was like, yeah, what's up, Bill Murray? I, I heard go, Cubs, go. At the end, like I was there. I experienced it. It was amazing. And the truth is talking about Jesus is a lot more about talking like a baseball game than it is trying to convince people that our religion is the best religion. Jesus didn't say go into the world and to convince everyone a philosophical debate. He didn't say, go into the world and convince everyone that your religion's the best. He didn't say, go into the world and try to twist people's arm to understand all of the theological distinctives that you believe. No, no, no. He said, go into the world and share the good news. What's the good news? What he's done for you. Tell your story of what you've seen and experienced. I may not have all the answers to all your questions, but I was lost. And now I'm found. I can't, I can't fully explain it, but what he's done in my heart, how he set me free. In some ways, think of yourself as a, a film projector. As you experience the light of Jesus, all you do is you let that light move through you and then let it come out of you. A film projector is a storyteller. It does this by taking a film reel that consists of thousands of images. Light is then passed through each frame, projecting an image onto a canvas. These images in sequence can tell us a powerful story of happiness, sadness, or even humor. Our lives in many ways are like a film projector. Every action we take and word we speak builds the narrative of a story God is wanting to tell through us. Even though we all have different backgrounds, we have a choice of what we will project when the light of God shines through us. So what would someone see if they watched the movie of your life? Would they see light or darkness? Would they see life or death? Would they see love? Would they see grace? Would they see faith? Would they see Jesus? You know, if you follow Jesus, 
That's a great question to ask. When someone sees me, would they see Jesus? Am I letting his light into my life? And am I, am I letting that light shine out of my life? It's not about being perfect. It's about following the perfect one. But all of this begs one more question. Well, why? Okay, you told me how, share my story, what I've seen and heard. Okay, I got that. But why? Why does it matter? Why does it matter if people see Jesus in me? Why should I share my story? Well, there's one more verse in Acts chapter 4 that I want to read, and it tells you why Peter couldn't stop talking about Jesus. It tells you why Peter had to live on mission, and it tells you why all of this matters. Acts 4.12. And this was given in his sermon, his little sermonette to the high council, and he says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. We have to talk about Jesus because if people don't know Jesus, they don't have any hope. Our hope is not in a what. Our hope is in a who. There's no political party, no amount of money, no job, no relationship you can have, no health, no degree, no education, no good work that you could do, no good deed you could do that could ever save your soul because there is salvation in one place and one spot only. It is in Jesus plus nothing else. There is one name and there is no other solution. It's him. And so people have to know about Jesus. I heard a quote a few months ago and it's just been sticking with me. It says, the gospel is only good news if it gets there on time. Think about that for a second. The gospel is only good news if it gets there on time. I mean, do you believe that the good news can change someone's life? That all around us there are lost and hurting people and another day that they go without Jesus is another day of pain? another day of loneliness, another day of regret, and that they don't need hope in life tomorrow. They need hope in life now. Like now, they don't need to wait till tomorrow. They, they need the good news today, that another day that goes by could be a day of pain or tragedy in their story. But if they have hope and they have Jesus, Jesus can help carry them through. Do you believe that people need the good news now? Not to mention, we are promised tomorrow. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Why wouldn't we believe him? We want to believe him when he tells us we can go to heaven, but we don't want to believe him when he tells us how we're going to get there. We need to take Jesus at his word. We need to believe him. So he's asking us, he's calling us, he's imploring us. If you are part of the found camp, if you are part of the 99, he is asking you to take his words and his mission seriously. So do you believe it? And if you do, the time is now. And this is not about building a church building. This is not about building a religion. We are trying to make heaven crowded. I want it to be awkward and uncomfortable when you get up there. Like, where do I go? Because there's so many people. We want to make heaven crowded. And so if you believe this, should we not have some urgency? Should it not light a fire inside of us that we're not playing religious games, but we serve a God who is real and alive and good news and not just good news for you. Yes, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but he is asking you, the hard, I'd say it's the harder part, to love your neighbor as you love yourself and yourself wants to go to heaven. <laughs> yourself wants life and life to the fullness. So do, don't you think you should share that with your neighbor too? And you can do that. Just tell him what you've seen and what you've heard, what you've experienced. And so we're going to sing a song. As we sing this song, lots of times, man, we can go in autopilot at church when we sing songs. I'm going to challenge you. This is a great song. It's called Build My Life. I'm going to challenge you to make this song a prayer, to pray this song as you sing it. Now, there's people in this room right now 
And I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, but there are some of you in here, you've never made the decision to follow Jesus. You've never actually surrendered your life to Jesus. You've been around spiritual things. You've been around church. You've heard Jesus proclaimed. And you know, you can sense the Holy Spirit moving right now. That's God moving in your life. And he's saying, you know what? You need to actually surrender to me. You need to confess your sin to me during the song. And you can do that. You can just say, God, I confess whatever it is. And then invite him in to be Lord of your life. Receive that good news. Receive life and, and life to the fullness. Go from the lost camp to the found camp. And then let him put you on mission to realize that you now have the answer, the thing that everybody is looking for. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that Jesus came. He could have stayed up in glory, could have stayed in his glorified form, could have stayed as deity, but he wanted to be deity here with us in the valleys. Man, don't, we don't ever want to lose sight of the fact that you came to be with us because you cared so much about the lost. Help us remember Help us remember that we were all lost ones. Help us remember what you've done for us, how you saved us, how you set us free. Let that good news resonate deep within our souls and our spirits. And then as that good news burns in us, give us a holy passion and desire to begin to figure out and learn how to share that with others. And if there are people in this room right now that don't know you, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, they have the boldness and the courage to say, I surrender. I'm tired of running. I know you're not gonna quit chasing me, so I'm tired of running. And they surrender their life to you. They will call on you. And we know that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.